All right, film geeks, today's class is all about The Exorcist Believer, David Gordon Green's latest attempt at a franchise. Let's talk about it. What's up, y'all? Welcome back to another episode of All Right, Let's Talk About It. My name is Savannah. I am your host. I do film reviews and film industry commentary. Ooh, y'all. Let me tell you about Louisiana weather real quick. So it, it's just strange. So we've been in a drought, right? Normal Louisiana summers, it rains for every day, almost every day for a good month and a half. That's normal Louisiana weather. But we've been in a drought. And it's it's crazy though, right? Because New Orleans, if it wasn't for like a little piece, of, a little strip of land, we'd be an island, essentially. Like we would be sitting on an island. So we're surrounded by water. There's water everywhere. Water levels have dropped. We're having this issue with salt in the Mississippi because we've had no rain and it's been ungodly hot, like dry hot, which is not normal because it's usually humid hot. And I've gotten used to humid hot. I've, I've gotten used to that. Like that's comfortable for me now. So when it was just dry hot this summer, it was unbearable. Well, we're getting into fall, right? And I figure it's probably going to be normal Louisiana fall, or well, New Orleans fall, I should say, where it doesn't really start to cool down until, you know, end of October going into November. No, it's cooling down now. So I was at the movie theaters last night and I was wearing, you know, long pants and regular t-shirt. And I had my blanket with me because, you know, going to the movies, I want my blanket. And I figured I'd be a little hot because I had pants on it. I've been wearing shorts recently, but I was so comfortable. It was 80 something degrees, like mid 80s. But the way the air was feeling, I could have worn a hoodie and not been uncomfortable. But that's, you know, it's 75 or 76 degrees outside right now and it's cool. That's not, that's like North Carolina weather, which is where I'm from originally before I moved here in 2020. And, you know, 75 or 70 something degrees in North Carolina, you know, you can wear a long sleeve with that. It, it's, it's warm, but it, it's still a little, little, it can be a little nippy, but this feels like North Carolina fall. It feels like it. It's very strange. I'm tired, tired of it. I want, I want to go back to normal because that makes me a little nervous for the winter time because New Orleans cold is awful. It's awful. Now, does the temperature dip really low? No, no, that's not the point. The point is that because it's New Orleans, because we are in a swamp and we're so far south, we're right here in the middle of the freaking Gulf, basically. It's humid all year round. So humidity in the wintertime is awful. It's wet cold. It's to the bone cold. It's, it's painful cold. So the best I can compare to are people in Chicago, I think would understand what that feels like. Um, that wind that just hits you in the bones. It's that kind of cold. And because it hasn't been the normal humid, it's been so dry lately. It makes me wonder what's the winter going to be like. But, you know, that's the tea here in New Orleans besides the usual fanfare of things. You know, we're into this, you know, spooky season. If you ever visit the city of New Orleans in the spooky season time, you have to go to State Street which is in uh, the middle of Uptown, kind of right outside of the Audubon neighborhood, down the street from Tulane and Loyola University, and it's the Skeleton House. And every year, this house decorates their front yard. It's so tacky, but it's the best thing ever. And they cover their front yard in skeletons. You know, just the plastic skeletons you get from the store, and they're all puns. They're all puns. There's one that's like FedEx, and it was DeadX you know, scary pop-ins. They have her hanging from a tree, a little morbid, but there we are. It's stuff like that. It's so funny and it's such a delight. It, it's it's quintessential New Orleans. This will be like super tacky and, and gaudy anywhere else, but in New Orleans, it's it makes sense and it's community. It's, it's one of those things everybody looks forward to. Like, there are crowds around the front yard and they know it. They know they're the hit of the season and it's so sweet that they just do. Th it takes so much for them to do this. And it's the same thing every year. It's not like, I don't think I've seen any super new skeleton features that they have, but it, they do the same thing every year and it's precious and it's sweet and it's cute. And it's adorable. And it's so tacky and gaudy, but the tacky and gaudy of it all just makes sense in New Orleans. <laughs> oh, I hope everyone else is having a better, you know, seasons of the year than we are down south because 
the, it was awful. It, it sucks. Everything's weird and confusing. Like, I'm in Louisiana. Why does it feel like North Carolina? Next thing you know, the leaves are going to start to change colors. And then I'm going to be really confused. But we're here to talk about a movie. We're here to talk about The Exorcist Believer. This is directed by David Gordon Green. I always trip over when I say his name. It, it's a lot of does and in the jazz in there. David Gordon Green. It trips me up every time. This dude right here, um, we have beef. We have serious beef because he did great in 2018 with Halloween Kills. He did great in 2021 with, um, no, Halloween, which is regular Halloween, the direct sequel to the first film. So 40 years later, he did great in 2018 with Halloween, you know, the 40 years later direct sequel. He did great, I thought, in 2021 with Halloween Kills. And then he ended that little, you know, trio of movies, the trilogy, with Halloween Ends. And it was awful. It was just not, it was not the Halloween that I know. Like we only got maybe five minutes of Michael Myers and like, that's who we're here for. I mean, yeah, it's so cool to see Jamie Lee Curtis reprise her role and, you know, be Laurie Strode. That's cool and everything, you know, it, it's cool to see, you know, the resurgence of the old characters from the original film, you know, Tommy Doyle and Lindsay stuff like that. That's cool. But I'm, we're here for Michael Myers, okay? We're here to see him kick ass and stab people. Like, that's what we're here for. And we only got, like, five minutes of him. Like, at the end of the movie, it was this, you know, battle scene between him and Lori. And I was just, that that's not my dude. That's not my guy. I, I expected better, and I was so angry at the way that ended. And I'm like, no, that, that we're not, I'm not going to accept this. I need you to redo this whole thing, because apparently he didn't, he didn't end it right. So we have to start from the beginning. And now he has this movie out, The Exorcist Believer. And I was a little nervous, even though I thought he did very well with Halloween and Halloween Kills. The way he ended Halloween, the way he ended it with Halloween Ends, I was a little skeptical with this. Like, how is he going to do? I, I just, I, I don't know. It, it made me question everything about him as a director and, and also as someone who knows how to properly interpret, you know, the IP, the, the original intellectual property. And I, I don't know, I, I was a little nervous. And, uh, and also the, the question, why? For what purpose do we need this? How, you know, The Exorcist came out in 1973 with Ellen Burstyn and Linda Blair, virtually unknown at the time. And it was smash. Like it was it's still, as far as I'm concerned, the scariest movie of all time. Now, Wednesday, I rewatched the movie for the first time in like 20 years. I've only seen the movie once when I was like 16 years old, and, th and that was enough. And then I watched it again just a couple of days ago just to, you know, prepare myself and remind myself, OK, this is what this, you know, this is the the story here. And um, it's terrifying and it's, sim it's simplistic in, it, in the way it scares you. It's not like movies of today where they have to kind of jump scare you like you're at a haunted house and you're just waiting for someone to come around the corner. This does something else. And it really just comes at your gut and your heart and your head and, and the way it scares you. It, it goes after that natural fear and not that superficial fear, but just that, that natural gut fear. That's what The Exorcist does. And it does it so brilliantly, brilliantly and, and, and with such simplicity and with a small cast. How does this movie measure up? This is, in a sense, supposed to kind of be a sequel, but not really. I mean, we have the return of Ellen Burstyn, who plays Chris O'Neill, the mother, in this movie. And that's supposed to be like the highlight of it all. Like, the mother is back. Um, we'll, we'll get into that part, but the question is, did he do the damn thing? Is this movie worth a ticket? It, does this movies, does the end product justify the, this movie's existence? Let's, let's, let's talk about it. <laughs> Again, this movie is directed by David Gordon Green. He also co-wrote the script, if I'm not mistaken. His co-writer was Peter Sattler. Let's look at him real quick. 
So he doesn't really have a huge resume. He directed, not re- directed, but oh yeah, he did. He's also a director and a writer. So he directed and wrote a movie called Camp X-Ray. And then he directed a movie called Broken Diamonds in 2021. And then he comes in as a screenwriter for this movie, The Exorcist Believer, again, directed by David Gordon Green. And it stars Leslie Odom Jr. Ellen Burstyn returns as Chris McNeil, Ann Dowd, Lydia Jewett, Olivia O'Neill. Raphael Sabarge. I've never known that man's name, but I've seen him in a couple of episodes of Law and Order SVU and Criminal Minds. He's an interesting dude. Jennifer Nettles. I don't know why I didn't recognize her from the onset, but if I'm not mistaken, yep, yep, this is the same Jennifer Nettles. She is um, the one of the lead singers. I guess, you know, the co-lead singer of, oh God, Sugarland. I love Sugarland. I, I love them very, very much. She's amazing. So this movie here. So this movie is about Victor Fielding, played by Leslie Odom Jr., his wife and their unborn child. They're in Haiti. I don't know if they're on a vacation or a work trip. He's a photographer. Looks like it might be a baby moon. Just like, you know, last little fun before the baby arrives. And they're in Haiti having a good time. He's taking photographs. He's a photographer. And um, she gets a special little blessing of protection over her, you know, unborn daughter, Angela. They have named her. Well, she's back at the hotel. He's somewhere taking pictures and the earthquake happens. So this kind of happens right around the time of the large Haiti earthquake. Unfortunately, mom dies in um, the aftermath like she dies from her injuries but baby is born fine we jump 13 years later we're in percy georgia and single dad victor with daughter angela they're doing the best they can you know it seems they have a great relationship she has a you know coming into her own we see she's becoming her own person and she decided i don't want to eat meat anymore because of a documentary she saw and he drops her off at school and she's like hey hey can i you know study at Catherine's place And he's like, yeah, sure. Okay. And we get to school and it seems like she's set her dad up. She's talking to another friend and she convinces that friend to say, hey, can you, you know, cover for me and Catherine? If our parents call, we're at your house or, you know, say what you need to say. Well, the girls walk into the woods and it looks like they're performing some kind of ritual. They want to talk to a spirit. She wants to talk to her mom. So she has a like necklace that her mom owned or that she thinks her mom owned. She wanted to take a scarf that she found, but her dad was like, nope, nope, not that one. So they're trying to talk to the spirit of whatever. And all of a sudden the girls are missing and they are missing for three days. And then they're randomly found in a barn some 30 miles away, you know, unharmed as it seemed, just, you know, a little bruise cut up from walking so far. Feet are all tore up and the girls are a little off. Something's a little wrong here not quite right well the story unfolds as you can imagine it turns out the girls are demon possessed and an exorcism has to be performed i mean pretty much regular fanfare this movie is about two hours long give or take i'm I'm trying to figure out where to start with this I, I had, I don't know what kind of expectations I had for this with possession films are either hit or miss, but they, they're, they're typically entertaining to some extent. Usually it takes good acting and a good story that, that the lead character, whoever they are, either have to be really good or they have to have a real, they have to be fleshed out wonderfully as a character. I think of like the Pope's Exorcist with Russell Crowe earlier this year. The movie was just all right. There were a lot of issues in terms of character development, but because Russell Crowe is such a good actor and so committed to his job, he took that movie to the next level, I thought. He really, I think, saved that movie from just being a complete failure of a film. That there's... This movie was, there were so many things that were wrong here and so many things that were just confusing. I mean, overall, the movie is just very lackluster and just kind of boring. It's not scary. There are a couple of moments where it's like, who? Like there's a moment where he lifts up a rock and there's a snake, you know, the imagery of the snake and the serpent, the devil and all that thing. There, There are a couple of little things in here that let us know that something dark is amiss. You know, at the very beginning when the girl is girls are in class, they're listening to 
It looks like a, they're listening or watching a movie of someone reciting The Raven by Edgar Allan Poe. When the girls are missing and we get a, a little shot, a scene into their um, into their classroom, one of their classmates is standing at the front of the class reading The Jabberwocky from, I believe it's Through the Looking Glass, um, Lewis Carroll from, you know, Alice's Adventures in Wonderland, the sequel Through the Looking Glass. That's where The Jabberwocky is, if I'm not mistaken. So, you know, the image of this great dragon um, that has to be defeated, you know, just little foreshadowing moments, imagery, very cheap, very cheesy and very on the nose. Like anyone, anybody could have picked that up. We know where this is going. And it was just very underwhelming. It was lackluster. It wasn't scary. And this is supposed to be in the same vein as the exorcist when it's not even the same vein. It's not even the same artery. It's not even the same body. This was just not that good. It's strange. Cause I, I feel like there is so much talent and potential within David Gordon green. And it's not like I can blame this on the writer and say, well, it's not the right. No, it's he's the director. He's the writer. And he picked a writer who is brand spanking new. Thank you. Um, you know, for giving him the opportunity. That's amazing. But I feel like there should have been someone with more experience and more, a bigger resume, you know, someone with a little more success under their belt than someone who's just starting out, just figuring it out. The, the writing was just not, everything was just, it got to the point where the movie was just very cheesy and goofy. Um, and just, you know, you know, Avengers assemble, you know, when they decided we have to perform this exorcism, everything just kind of happened out of order. Here's the thing with these movies and this particular genre, you know, possession films. You can stray. You can bend the rules, break the rules. You can step out of line and do your own thing. We've seen these things done before, but there are still rules within the genre that have to make sense to be, you know, there, there, there are certain things you have to do. And within the genre of possession films, one of the things that's common, there are a couple of films that fall outside of this, but for the most part, they're Catholic in nature, right? There's always the Catholic church or, or some sort of Catholic priest or a Catholic figure that comes to the rescue. I think of the conjuring. We have the Warrens who are just under the Catholic church and have to perform, you know, exorcisms for people. So that that's always I think been one of the more exciting parts of the movie is seeing religion in a way be a superhero. You know, and not just a supernatural superhero. It's seeing religion and worship in that way that we can, you know, take religion and worship and defeat evil. I mean, these movies are basically just an over exaggeration, a way to make sense, or even what's the word? Not pers personify, but you know, bring to life spiritual warfare, a way to kind of confront it in a very on almost kind of real way. And and then you have that battle between good and evil, where Jesus clearly represents good and this demon represents evil, and it's this battle, this epic battle that whether you believe in God or not, it just makes sense we kind of stray from that a bit. Now we do definitely have a Catholic priest in here. I forget his name. He was, he really wasn't all that important. We have the nurse neighbor who is Catholic and we have a, it seems a charismatic or Pentecostal neighbor down the road. We have, you know, one of the girl's parents, Catherine's parents who are religious, they're Christians. They go to church, their pastor. It seems they might be like a Presbyterian, you know, something that's not Catholic or orth orthodoxy in a sense, but it's not charismatic, whatever that middle is, evangelical, I guess you could say. Let's, yeah, we'll go with that, evangelical. So you have Pentecostal, evangelical, and Catholic all in room. It's like a joke. And then you have a root worker, so a woman who works with roots, and they're all in this, this together to perform an exorcism. And of course, to put the cherry on top, you have the atheist father. It's a hot mess. So we're here to defeat evil, and yet we have no clear pathway of defeating this evil. And I think that bugged me a little bit. There are certain things that bug me. I think if you're a Christian, there are things that are going to bug you, but we're going to talk about that in a hot minute. I'm just going to address Christian specifically. So if you're not a Christian, it's not going to make sense to you, I don't think, or it's not going to apply to you. You're not going to care. So you can just be past that part and go towards the end. But 
So, yeah, the movie was just lackluster. It was boring. It was kind of all over the place. It was trying to be inclusive by including all these different things, saying we can use all these things together to defeat this kind of evil. But in reality, I mean, I'm not going to sit here and say, well, exorcisms are reality. I don't know. But in reality, a Catholic priest would never work alongside a root worker. That would never happen. I mean, you might be able to get a Catholic priest, a you know, an evangelical preacher and a charismatic congregant in the room together, but not with a root worker. Again, I think I'm getting ahead of myself. There was just a lot of just things that just didn't quite make sense in the execution of it all. It, it wasn't very clear. It was doing too much. It was trying to do too much. It was trying to include all these different things to say, I don't know what they were trying to say. It was just weird. But uh, good, we'll get away from that. What are some other issues that I had with this? I thought the cast was too big. I thought the cast was way too big. Unfortunately for this film, it is, you know, riding the coattails of an amazing movie. And I think one of the strengths of the original The Exorcist was the small cast. Very, you know, you really just had the mom, the daughter, and the two priests. Really in principle. You had a couple of little supporting characters here and there to help build the story. But for the most part, your main principal characters is just four. We have a lot of principal characters in this movie who are playing a part in this exorcism. And I'll be honest with you, I had a, I had a really hard time remembering their names. We, we're not given enough time to really get to know who they are and why they have a strength that could defeat this evil. We don't, the only thing that could you know, defeat this evil would be their faith, but we don't even get a chance to get to know their faith. We don't get that opportunity. We're just given these images. We showed the one guy, you know, raising his hands and worshiping the Lord and somebody has a tambourine. We see the mom and the dad and the children in church, but we're really not given an opportunity to get to know their faith. It seems that at points the director is kind of mocking their faith. I don't know if he just doesn't understand Christianity or if he doesn't have any respect for it, he doesn't like it, or if he really was just trying to say, you know what, not only evangelical or you know Catholic Christians can do this. I don't know. It was just too much. It was all over the place. So there, the cast was way too large, I thought. There was too many people. Again, there was very cheesy dialogue. This eye that, you know, different kinds can make this happen, or, you know, we can all do this together. And it's like, you know... It, Avengers is simple kind of deal. So the writing was kind of off. The story was very rushed. Um, there are some things that were just missing. We don't really get a clear cut descent into madness. The girls come back from the woods and they're tainted, immediately tainted. Like they're already clearly possessed. We're not getting this, the slow descent that's normal and natural in your possession films. It just happens very quickly. We don't really get to see what this does to them and how it destroys them. We're never given an opportunity to really get to know these girls to see what's being destroyed. Not just themselves, their bodies, but their personalities and their values, their hearts, so to speak. I, and in speaking of the girls, my biggest question here is why were there two girls? What 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 was the purpose for having two girls? This story again is centered around Victor Felding and his daughter Angela, and they're black. They're the black, you know, the black characters for those who need context. And then you have Catherine and her family, parents whose names I don't even remember, and you know, they're the white counterpart. I don't know why Catherine was there. The entire story, for the most part, is focused on Victor and his daughter. We get the most time with them. They are the characters that are the most fleshed out, the ones we really get to know, um, the names that we actually remember. And we get to the ending, and I just didn't care what happened at the end because, again, we were not given an opportunity to really get to know these other characters and this other girl who's also possessed. And we really don't get a sense of their relationship as friends. We, we see them together one time. We hear her name come out of her mouth really one time. And the ending was just not it for me because why should I care? I don't I don't care. Of course, I'm going to root for one kid over the other because I only know one. I don't know this other girl. There was, what was the point of having this extra girl here? 
She served no real purpose. I don't know if it was just to kind of ratchet up the intensity and the anxiety because at one point they're forced to make a choice. But even then, it was just like, we know who's going to get chosen here because of who this movie has chose, has decided to focus on. We're never given this opportunity to make a choice. The choice was already made for us when the movie started. I mean... I don't understand the point of having the second girl. There was no need for her. She didn't really add anything or take away anything from the story. She she was she served no purpose other than just to fill up time. Although her possession I thought was just a little more convincing than the other one. But that's my that's not the point. It was just there were too many people. I thought the second girl was just unnecessary. There was no point to it, especially if you're not going to give us the time to really get to know her and her family and their dynamic, their faith. Um, if you're not going to give us time to get to know these girls and their relationship, their friendship, you know, why would Catherine, who is clearly Christian and believes in the Bible, why would she help this girl named Angela, who is an atheist, it seems, perform a seance in the middle of the woods. Why? It's just little things. There was no, There's nothing about this movie to me that justifies its existence. For what reason did this need to be here? For what reason did, I believe this was Universal, pay Warner Brothers $400 million for the rights to this movie? So you know what that means. We're going to get more of these from Mr. David Gordon Green. Okay, parental units, this is the part of the podcast where I address you specifically and answer your most burning question. Is this movie appropriate for my child? Quick little note here. So I'm talking to the parents and also stick around. I'm going to talk to the Christians as well. Something tickled my brain a little bit and I, I figure it might tickle yours. So I want to talk about it. But first, the parental units. Is this appropriate for your child? So this movie is clearly rated R. We're not going to argue with that, right? So it's rated R for language, disturbing images, sexual references, some violent content. I believe in this film, I'm not, it wasn't clear. I, I think there is some, there's an allusion to the fact that she, one of the girls might have been touching herself. I, it was a little unclear for me. It was super quick, like really quick. Um. Definitely violence, definitely language, because these girls are possessed. So we're hearing things come out of their mouths that shouldn't come out of little girls' mouths. Um, violence, there is an instance with Ellen Bernstein. So again, Ellen Bernstein is the mother from the original the original film, Chris McNeil. And real quick, this has nothing to do with anything, but I don't understand why she was here. There was no point in bringing this in, her into the movie. She really didn't serve much of a purpose other than, you know, a... Look what we got you, like a sweet little gift, a way to get you into the theater, so to speak. But her her role in this is so minimal and so short. Um, Yeah, but there's a nasty little piece of violence that happens to her. Spoiler alert. Um, one of the girls takes a kind of a steel cross and stabs her in the eyes and blinds her. So there's that. So, yeah, definitely bloody violence, some gross things like, you know, black gunk coming out of their mouths one of the girls regurgitates something really awful and i'm not exactly sure what it was you know the green gunk from the first film we get a little taste of that which is a weird way to put it but it's there so yeah the, a lot of gross things a lot of violence obviously not appropriate for your elementary age kid not appropriate for your middle schooler i think your older high school kid might be all right if you watch it with them again you know what appropriate for your kid. You know your kid. You know what your kid can handle and what your kid can't handle. You know it's appropriate for you and your family and your values. So go at this with that in mind. But no, this is not appropriate for children in the slightest. Um, quintessential rated R horror film. I would not recommend. Now, talking to the Christian. So I I've mentioned this before. I am a Christian, Bible-believing, you know, God-fearing, Jesus-following Christian. So that's what you know, operates my day to day. Right. So this being a movie about exorcism where the church is involved, there is a sort of soft spot for that, even though I'm not Catholic. I, I love the war between good and evil, the good, the war between, you know, 
the war, the power of faith in a sense. I, I love that part of it all. I think that's the sweet part. That's the redeeming part is seeing how faith prevails. To me, that was a cool part of the nun because at the end, that's how the nun was destroyed. It was faith. Simple faith. A lot of these movies really comes down to a crisis in faith. And we have here not so much a crisis in faith, but a man who's a complete atheist. And we never really get a sense until maybe a moment in the film where he has this internal battle or this war that he's waging against religion, Christianity, Jesus, what have you, or some sort of religious trauma. All we know is that his wife died unexpectedly, violently, and tragically. And you know, right when they were beginning a new, beautiful stage of life, parenthood. So I imagine he is very angry, but we never really get the sense that he's angry with God until we get this moment of a conversation where it's just, oh, clearly he just doesn't believe. We don't know, but it's, we don't have the crisis of faith here. And I think that's where it just kind of fell for me because uh, obviously, it's it's this movie is dependent on this man coming to believing that what he's seeing is true, but it just it never really comes full circle. But what tickles my brain in this, and I think as a Christian, you're going to see this and you're going to be bothered slightly because you probably know the word of God, I assume. So you know what's sin and what's not. And in fighting this evil that is a demon that is possessing these children, I think you're going to find it a little weird that a root worker is involved. Not that root workers shouldn't be involved in exorcism. I don't know much about it, but this is something that's clearly not biblical and something that no you know leader in the faith would participate in or get involved in, or, you know, play party to. So I think it's going to tickle your brain slightly. You're probably going to say, how are you able to fight evil with evil? Because that's how the Bible would interpret it. Come at me if you will, if you're not Christian, but I'm just telling you what the Bible says. It doesn't make sense from a Christian perspective. It's a little off. And I think that's where it lost me a bit because I'm trying to be objective and just step away and say, okay, let's get into film mode. But some things just can't be separated. I'm watching these men and women of God, two of them are clergy, you know, fight this demon. And yet they're holding hands with what we would consider in Christianity paganism. It's just a little weird. So I just want to put that out there for you. Um, If that's something that would make or break it for you, there, there you have it. Now you know. Hopefully that helps. Want to advertise on this podcast? Check the episode description to see how you can be featured on the next episode. Thank you so much for listening to me rant and rave about yet another movie. So that was The Exorcist Believer, directed by David Gordon Green. Um, just to sum it all up, I I thought it was just very underwhelming. It wasn't scary. It was just weak in so many aspects. And the cast was way too big. Those are my thoughts. If you happen to go and see the film, let me know. Let me know what you thought. Let me know what you think. Entertaining wise, entertainment wise, I I think... I don't know. I don't know how you'll feel about it. Just let me know what you think. So what's coming up? I finally figured out a movie for next week. I was, you know, stomping, trying to figure out what am I going to see next week? Because, you know, the Taylor Swift movie comes out next Friday and a bunch of movies shifted their schedule. Some moved to next year, one moved to next year to avoid, you know, having to compete with the Taylor Swift movie and understandably so, but it makes my, my situation a little frustrating because like I go to the movies every week. What am I going to see so I'm going to have two movies that I'm seeing next week so next Thursday I am seeing the Royal Hotel I believe I can get that on VOD or it might be on a streaming service somewhere but I want to see it in theater so the Royal Hotel I cannot wait to watch that one and then Sunday I am going to watch the Hunger Games yep the Hunger Games is making its way back to theaters um, right before well just a couple of weeks or a month or so before the prequel comes out I still have to finish the book I've started it I just need to keep pushing I need, I need to find the time to just sit down I don't like reading in my bedroom at all I don't know why um yeah I don't like reading in my bedroom I think it's I don't like the lighting in my bedroom so when I turn on the light it's too bright I like a soft lighting and I can't get that in this room and it's really irritating so 
that's what's coming up. So we have the Royal Hotel, Hunger Games. So yeah, I'm going to do a whole review on the Hunger Games. The problem is you're not going to get that full review until right before the prequel comes out in November. So you will get a little small TikTok review, but you're not going to get the full review until um, November. I'm actually making that a $2 Tuesday. So that's how that's going to work. And then, and then, and then in two weeks, Killers of the Flower Moon. Oh my goodness, I can't wait. Can you hear, can you hear me smiling? I am smiling. I'm so excited. Huh. Have you gotten your tickets yet? I totally got my tickets. I'm such a nerd. I got my tickets as soon as I got the notification. No, I actually checked my email randomly and said tickets are on sale. Went ahead and got it. Snatched up. Got IMAX. I can't wait. Oh my goodness. The only thing I don't like about IMAX theaters is that they're not reclining seats. And understandably so, because they're trying to pack as many seats in there as possible because that screen is so freaking big. But I hate that the seats are not reclining and reclining seats would be really, really nice for a three and a half hour long movie. So chances are, um, if I'm able to switch out the ticket for a um, for a prime seat, I will do it. But other than that, it looks like I'm seeing it in IMAX and then uh, the Freddy movie about animatronics with Josh Hutcherson and Matthew Lillard. Friday Nights at Freddy's? Friday, so whatever it's called, the Freddy movie. I'm seeing that as well. I can't wait. It's going to be fun. I'm so excited for what's to come. Thank you so much for listening. Don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe. Tell your friends all about it. You guys are wonderful. I love you very much. I hope you have an amazing weekend, and I will see you soon.